If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians, we are about halfway, well, a third of the way through chapter 6 this morning. We'll be looking at verses 6 through 8, the responsibility, the provision for teachers. You have no doubt heard the saying, what goes around comes around. You've heard of that. I'm sure it's, it's popular. You hear it ever so often. But did you know that that principle comes from Scripture? I've, my mom used to tell me, don't wear out your welcome. And even when you go over somebody's house, don't wear out your welcome. Lo and behold, I discovered years later, I read that in the Proverbs. That's where she got it. A lot of these statements that are wise and true come from Scripture. And so does this saying, what goes around comes around. We know it in this phrase, what you sow, you will reap. What goes around comes around. And it is a principle that we get from Scripture. The principle of sowing and reaping is one truth that people would desperately like to shelve away as merely fable. It is not fable. It is true. It doesn't always come back tit for tat, so to speak. But the what you sow, you're going to reap. You, you sow this kind of behavior and this kind of results are going to happen in your life in some degree. The gospel truth, no matter how much people would like to shelve it as merely fable, the gospel truth is that it will not, it has never, and it cannot be avoided. What you reap is what you will sow. There are many biblical examples of this. Abraham sowed to the flesh and he reaped Ishmael. Isaac sowed to the flesh and he reaped Esau. Jacob sowed to the flesh, and he reaped Simeon and Reuben. Lot sowed to the flesh, and he reaped Moab and Ammon. Samson sowed to the flesh, and he reaped blindness and slavery. You see, the law of sowing and reaping is sure. It's there, and you cannot avoid it. In this series, we are, we've titled it Keeping in Step with the Spirit series, and there are five commands that are given to us here, and all of them are flowing from chapter 5 in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And this in chapter 6 is a very practical section, a series of five commands given to believers on how we are to love one another, ways in which we are to carry out this injunction that's given to us as followers of Jesus Christ. They are repair, the first one that we looked at in verse 1 of chapter 6. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So the first command that's given to us is that we have a responsibility to one another to encourage and to repair, that is restore. And the, the word there is used in fixing a bone, setting a bone or mending a net. The second one Second command is given in verses 2 and 3, reciprocate. We notice the priority, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. And then the perspective, who are we? Verse 3 essentially says, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he is self-deceived. So we repair and then we reciprocate. We bear one another's burdens. The priority is others. The perspective is, who are we to think? To say that we do not have to help or we're too high or we're too far along in order to go back and help someone else. We have a proper perspective. We are self-deceived if we think that. And then in verses 4 and 5, the last time we were together in Galatians, rehearse, repair, reciprocate, and rehearse. In verse 4, the personal accountability to Jesus Christ, that is the examination in verse 4, Each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. And then the stewardship. For we must all bear his own load. Each one must bear his own load. Though we bear one another's burdens, there is a stewardship that all believers are given and that load is the responsibility for each individual. You bear your own load We know that that load is light. It's not burdensome. We can carry it, but there is a load that no one else can bear, and those are those basic Christian responsibilities that we all have. 
I cannot relieve you of your responsibility to be obedient. You must bear your own load. Now we have in verses 6 through 8 the responsibility. And then next week we'll look at in verses 9 and 10 the resolve. But for this week, this command is directed at those who benefit from the one who labors in the word. So we have the provision for teachers And that is the responsibility of those who are being taught. That's what we have in verse 6. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches. So we have provision for teachers. That is the responsibility of those who are being taught. And there is a given, an assumption in the verse, in verse 6, that the word is really being taught. And that's important. And we'll speak a, a little bit about that. It's important that the word really be taught. Those are the ones that you encourage and support. And then we have a general principle in verses 7 and 8. The general principle that follows. And that principle enforces the responsibility of the taught. And it applies to life in general. It's not just in this context in which this principle operates. It operates in the principle in the context of life in general terms regardless of what we're doing. So this fourth command is the responsibility of those who are taught. There's provision in verse 6 and is based upon the principle in verses 7 and 8. So let's read, let's first read verse 6. This is the responsibility of those who are taught, the provision for teachers. He says, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches. And this verse is puzzling Because it doesn't appear to have a connection with either verse 5 or verse 7. In the larger, excuse me, many have taken the position that Paul is adapting some well-known truth saying, some well-known maxim from Jewish and Hellenistic writings. And he he may have well been doing that. If you have a New International Version, you see that reflected in how it is arranged in your Bible. Because in the NIV, you have verses 1 through 5, and then you have verse 6, separate, separate by itself, and then you have verses 7 through 10 in another big paragraph. And what that reflects, of course, is those translators who worked on the NIV, their understanding that this is a, a, truth, a truism, a, a true maxism, or maxim that Paul is stating here that applies, and it has very little connection with verses 5 and verse 7. And you see that in the way they've arranged it in the NIV. And it may have been true that Paul uh, used that. He would not have needed to use that because we know that our Lord said the worker is worthy of his support back in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 10. So Paul, it's not necessarily uh, an absolute that he did or that it was necessary to do so. There's plenty of things that are stated in the Gospels and in the Scriptures of the Old Testament where Paul would not have have had to do that but if he did it it's no there's no matter inspiration authority is not attacked or is not uh, criticized or curtailed in any way but if we were to look upon closer examination i think we would discover that the verse fits quite well in this context it's not something necessarily separate and all by itself out there in the larger context of chapter six Verse 6 is one among other exhortations calling for mutual help among believers. And we've already seen that in verse 1. If anyone is called in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. So there's the one another's in action right there. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens. There's another one another action that is, that is mutual in the body of Christ. You look at verse 9. We haven't gotten there yet. Let us not lose heart in doing good. Doing good, poof, obviously for one another. Not restricted to one another, of course. Let us not lose heart in doing good. Verse 10. While we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So in the larger context, verse 6 here is just another exhortation calling for mutual help among the believers. So it's not something that's disconnected with what came before and what comes after. It fits quite well. There is a conjunction here also. Now, if you'll note in your translations, you probably don't have the conjunction represented, do you? 
I don't think you do. The one who has taught the New American Standard, English Standard, King James, New King James, ESV, RSV, New Revised Standard Version, none of those include the conjunction. But there is a conjunction there. The only Bible translation that I could find that has a conjunction is the American Standard Version. It came out in 1901, very literal translation, and it has but. So we need to understand if there is a connection here, we need to understand what the connection is. So the connection, we could say, may be to verse 2. So it would read something like this. We would understand it something like this. Bear one another's burdens, down in verse 6. Now, this is one form in which the command may be obeyed in bearing one another's burdens. It's quite a jump from verse 6 all the way back to verse 2. There's a lot of information between there. It's a big jump. The connection may be made to verse 5. And we would understand it like this. Every man who, excuse me, every man will bear his own load, verse 6, but this does not exempt you from bearing the burden of your teachers. Hmm, that seems to make sense, doesn't it? Because there is a, a conjunction there. It's D-E, debt, is a conjunction there. But most of the translations don't reflect this. But if we were to translate, bring the conjunction in, uh, the conjunction but would probably be the best way to understand this. So in light of verse 5, every man will bear his own load. Paul perhaps is anticipating, as he often does in his letters, anticipating, ha, I'm out, I bear my own load, you bear your own load. But... But this does not exempt you from bearing the burden of your teachers. Now it seems to make sense. Now it flows. Now it's not something floating out with no connection between verses 5 and verse 7. The connection to verse 5 seems most reasonable in light of the context and the argument that we just presented. Now regarding finances, regarding money... Paul's more common practice with regard to financial compensation was to assert the right of those who preach and teach to claim support. That's what he did. And his personal appeal to that right occurs in 1 Corinthians. In fact, if you'll just look back just briefly in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll see this. There's a couple of things to show you in, verse, in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 3, verses 3 through 7 is his appeal from reason. His appeal from reason. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles? And get this. And the brothers of our Lord and Peter. Guess what? Peter was married. Yes, he was. The first pope was married. Or only do Barnabas and I have a right to refrain from working, or not have a right to refrain from working, who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense. So you see, his appeal uh, from reason is here in verses 3 through 7. His common practice uh, with regard to this was, was to assert the right of those who preach and teach to claim support. And this is his personal claim here. In verses 8 and 9, he appeals from the law. Where he quotes, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. threshing. And in verses 10 through 14 is his appeal based upon the work, based upon the labor. In verse 10 he says, or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much that we reap, or if we reap, material things from you. There's the principle. So, though Paul's practice uh, was not to ask for money, and he worked for himself, his practice was to assert the right of those who preach and teach to claim this support. 1 Timothy 5.18 contains Old Testament quotes in support of that, two Old Testament quotes in support of that. So while he argues from 
these bases, his personal practice was not to receive material possessions. If you're still in 1 Corinthians, you can look down at verse 15. After he asserts his right to all of these, he says in verse 15, But I have used none of these things, and I am not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case. For it would be far better for me to die than to have any man make my boast an empty one. For I preach the, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about. If I'm under compulsion, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So in verses 15 through 18, he says, even though I have the right, I did not assert my right. This is the infant church. The church is young. It's in its first, uh, Corinthians in its first 20 years of existence. And he did not want to be a burden on the churches in this regard. So even though he did not uh, uh, insist on this material provision from him, uh, for him, he did not hold himself up as an example to others in this regard. We would say, somebody might say, well, we should be as Paul and not, and not go after this. And, and nobody, no preacher, I hope, wants to go after this. But we can also, we also know in Scripture that Paul did not set himself up as an example. I want you to follow my example in doing all the labor yourself, as well as studying and teaching. Paul did not do that. Still, he fully recognized that financial stewardship was an indispensable element of faithful service to Christ and his church. Here in the book of Galatians, he takes a different perspective on the matter. And the different perspective is this. He commands the Galatian believers to share all good things with the one who teaches. Other portions of Scripture, he asserts the right. He'll get, he says, yes, you have the right. Here, he, comes, he appeals to the congregation and he says, share all good things with the one who teaches. That's the different perspective that he takes in this particular passage. And as he writes this, the way he writes it, back in Galatians, the way that he writes this, all the Galatian believers are thought of as being in one of two categories. You are in the category of the one who is taught, or you're in the category of the one who teaches. And he's speaking of class of people, not individuals, not particular people, but as a class. Everybody fits in the class of one who is being taught, or the one who is doing the teaching. The word taught and teaching are the same Greek word, and it's the word that we get in our English, catechism. Katageo is the word. It's where we get catechism. The word catechism refers to any kind of oral instruction or preaching. Not necessarily the content because the word was used in, in other Greek writings as well. So it's not necessarily pertaining to content. The word itself means Oral instruction. You didn't read this necessarily on a billboard. You sat under. That's the implication. You sat under teaching. You were indoctrinated. How's that? Indoctrinated. That's a great word. It's a word people like to poo-poo now, but indoctrination is a great word. Just so long it's not in error. Any kind of oral instruction or preaching. In Acts chapter 21, in verses 21 and verse 24, the word is used... And it's translated like this, have been told, you have been told, you've been catechized, you've been instructed. That's the idea of the word. Uh, in chapter 18 of Acts, in verse 25, in the context of Apollos, the text says, Apollos had been instructed. There's your word catechize again. Had been instructed. He had been, he had received instruction. And in Romans chapter 2, eight, in verse 18, the source of that instruction is given for us. For Paul, there, Paul says, being instructed out of the law. Being instructed is your word catechize, and where did it come from? The source, out of the law. So the idea is clear here. The one divinely called to protect, instruct, direct the church, the one who is giving the biblical worldview, the one devoted to studying and teaching, the one who is doing that, and the one who are receiving the benefits of that. Those are the two classes 
of people that he categorizes here. Now it's important that we understand this, that the one who has taught the word, the word. Don't breeze over that little prepositional phrase, the word. That's important. The one who has taught the word. And I want to show you a couple of passages. What do you mean by the word? Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. In this passage, the word that we have in Galatians 6.6 6 is logos, okay? The same word that you have in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and logos was God, okay? So you, you have this word, this truth, so in Acts 13, 26, you have the testimony of the missionaries. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, to us, Lagos, to us the message, and it's the message pertaining to salvation. It's the message of salvation. That was the message, that was the truth that the early missionaries preached the message of salvation of Jesus Christ. Look over a couple of pages to Acts chapter 15 and verse 7. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by the mouth, by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel. Of the gospel defines what we're talking about, what word is. What word is it? It's the gospel. It's the truth. The word of the gospel and believe. And if you a couple more pages over to chapter 20. Over to chapter 20 and verse 32. Paul says in verse 31, Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace to helps define what word are you talking about it's the word of salvation it's the word of his grace the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified so it's important that we understand just a little rehearsal there that the, mission, the missionary's message was the word of truth. And that's the same word that Paul is talking about here. This is not political statements. This is not Norman Vincent Peale feel-good stuff. This is the truth. And the responsibility of those who hear the truth and listen to the truth, if it's truth, they have a responsibility to share in all good things. But the, one of the qualifiers is it must be truth. Okay? It must be truth. Paul is not arguing that whoever dons a robe has the, uh, has the right to be supported by you. He's not saying that. The last thing Paul would say is whoever dons a robe deserves to be supported. Whoever dons a robe or whoever steps up there and preaches the truth, that one is your responsibility to share in all good things. And we'll talk about what all good things entails in just a moment. But we cannot pass by this. It is doctrine, it is truth, and Scripture is the content of, the content of this word here. The teaching and the learning pertain specifically to the word. Specifically to the word. Our message is not political. Though we would say from the pulpit... You need to be aware of what's going on around you and you need to act wisely. Our message is not about health. It's not about having, being successful in business. It's about the word. It's about the truth. Those who labor in the word. Scripture is the authoritative word from God to man. It is that word that is the power of salvation, right? Romans 1.16 it is the power, it's the what transforms people from the kingdom of 
darkness to the kingdom of light. It's what sets people free. We sing about the light bursting forth and the, and the, the bars flying open. It's the gospel that sets men free. It's that word that must be preached. You must be learning. If you go to church here and in six months later you know nothing more about the word of God than you did when you got here, then leave. If you're going somewhere and you've been there and you don't know any more about the word than you did when you got there, leave because you're not being taught the word. If you're not growing spiritually, now it may be because you're not listening. Oh my. That's possible. I think that's possible. But if the word is not being preached, if you're not growing, you need to leave. You need to go somewhere where God's word is held up as authoritative and sufficient for all of life and godliness and proclaimed without reservation, without being ashamed. The whole council, as Paul said in Rome and Acts 20, the whole counsel of God. I don't pull any punches. I don't soften anything because I'm afraid somebody might, somebody might react a certain way. So I'm kind of just kind of, okay, next verse. We're not going to do that. You can't do that. Preachers have no authority. They have no liberty to do that. And I, I, have, to share, I have to share this. Today's what? Business meeting, right? Now, why did this passage come up in a business meeting Sunday? I promise you I didn't plan it that way. But there have been other times when I know a passage is coming up. We're dealing with this today, and, it, and it, it's, you know, in God's good providence, this is happening in society or this is happening in the church, and you're like, oh, my, God is good. We're going to talk about this, and it's, I'm not pulling punches. I'm not skipping verses. I have no agenda. This is just the next passage in here, and, I, and that's, that's, what is that. so that's what is there, so we're going to preach it. So <laughs> I told Bob, I said, you know, you know what passage is coming up this week, right? And while we're working through the budget. So now it's coming back. It's, it's, it goes that way, and it comes this way. So we're going to preach the word. And we're going to say exactly what Scripture says, nothing more and nothing less. <laughs> no, matter, <laughs> no matter what the occasion might be. So Paul, all this, Paul preached the word, and he's telling the church there that those who benefit from the word of God have the responsibility to share all good things with those who teach the word. But we need not, again, we need not pass over, we should not pass over this, that important prepositional phrase, the word. The teacher's text is the word. The teacher's authority comes only through the word. Only through the word. The only authority that I have in your life is what scripture gives me. Nothing more. Nothing more. The content of valid Christian instruction is always Jesus Christ and that always comes from the word of God. This is the sole authority. There is not two books. There's not book one, book two. There's no Book of Mormon. There's no anything else. This is it. This is Scripture. So as he says, the one who is taught the word is to share. Share all good things with him who teaches. The share, actually, in verse 6, share is the very first word in the sentence. And it's a command. The very first word in the sentence and in reference to things, this word share in reference to things means to share in. But with persons, with people, it means to contribute a share to or give to. And so the emphasis here is on, in the context here, the emphasis is on giving or granting. That doesn't mean finances only or material things only. We still have to address that, all good things. But the emphasis here is on giving or granting. Share is the command. So it, we, might, we might think of it this way. Let the one receiving, and that would be the noun, let the one receiving, you see that the one who is taught, the one who is receiving, that's the noun, and the verb is share. And then you have 
you have almost like two objects with the one giving in all good things. Those of you that know Greek, both of those are dative. Both of those are dative. That's a direct object. Mostly, most of the time. So let the one receiving, the noun, the verb is share with the one giving and all good things. And I find this very interesting. Because already, and the church is 20 years old, the birth of the church, Acts chapter 2, to this point where he's writing the book of Galatians, 20 years old, at most 20 years old. Already in these early years of the life of the church, the Christian teaching was at least a heavily time-consuming occupation that deserved material and or financial compensation. Already. Isn't that interesting? Some of those, some, some would try to say, well, the, the, the early pe- people did not do this. They didn't do that. They met in homes. It doesn't matter. Homes are not. The injunction is still, if you benefit from the teaching, you pay them materially, financially. And already in the church is 20 years old or less, less, it's already viewed as a time-consuming occupation. It's not something that just grew over time. So whether or not the assemblies gathered in homes or as we know later to be the case in other buildings, there was a teacher who was devoted to teaching and provision was offered to that teacher by the members. Now we need to answer in all good things, is to share with him in all good things. And that is, uh, it's not the easiest phrase to pin down. It may include spiritual benefits as well as material benefits because the phrase is quite general. So the context is going to help us here a little bit. The phrase is general. The context in verses 2 and 5 lead us away from the understanding that this phrase is as calling for good conduct. In other words, Paul really here is calling for the students to imitate their teacher. No, it's more than imitation. There is some real bearing one another's burdens, carrying your own load. This is more than just imitation that's talking about here. And that's a pretty rare view. It's an older view, but it's rare. Those who are tall are to become a sharer in all good things. Specifically here in the context, material things. Material things. Now I want to show you some passages. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And verse 26 and 27. Romans... 15 verses 26 and 27. And here's a, a testimony of some very faithful churches. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so and they are indebted to them. We note that principle. They are indebted to them, verse 27. For if the Gentiles have shared in their, that is the people in Jerusalem, Jews, shared in their spiritual things, they, the Gentiles, are indebted to minister to them also in material things. You see how Paul goes back and forth with, if you've benefited spiritually, then you need to repay and encourage and help materially. He lays that injunction upon them. If you go to 1 Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Romans 15 verses 26 and 27 is talking about the receiver. The receiver. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 11. Paul, we, met, we read this statement. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? There's that principle again. Now, I apologize for the uh, Bible sword drill thing here, but if you'll go back to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. Paul 
Paul gives a list here in Romans 15, looked at the receiver. Romans 12 and verse 13 looks at the giver. In the context here, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints. There it is, that's it. Contributing to the needs of the saints. And again, in that context, it, it means... You cannot, la- you cannot pinpoint it. Is he talking about finances or are you talking about material things? And that's one of the difficult things about this phrase in Galatians. All good things. It may include spiritual benefits as well as material benefits. But Paul's practice, Paul's instruction to other churches is this. If, they, if you benefited spiritually from them, is it too much to ask that you return material, material blessings to them? And what it does is it frees them up and it allows them to devote them to themselves to study so that they can t- continue to be a blessing. That's where Paul's coming from. Now, no, there's no doubt the full-time minister must be sincere in his motives, and he doesn't necessarily have to be full-time, but he must be sincere in his motives. He does not work for money. His calling is not just another job. For somebody to do this because they think it's lucrative, out to lunch. Not that not that not that you're not caring for us, for my family. Not saying that. But you don't do this to get rich. This is not a get rich quick. Now there are there 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 are those out there you know. Uh, I can name a few of them on my hand right now in about a 10 mile radius, 10 or 12 mile radius that do. But don't don't do that for that reason. Don't do that for that reason. You cannot do that for that reason. A call to teach, to be, to devote yourself, your life, to study in this one book where your, you, your life revolves around this one book and all the tools and everything else that involves in this so that you can be a blessing to others so that you can please God in this regard is, is not just a call to another job. Now, at this point, John Calvin storms in, and I mean storms in, storms in with this statement. How disgraceful is it to defraud of their temporal support by those whom our souls are fed, to refuse an earthly recompense to those from whom we receive heavenly benefits. But it is, and always has been, the disposition of the world to freely bestow on the ministers of Satan every luxury and hardly to supply godly pastors with necessary food. It has been that way at times. Did you know at times in the past, people have given to missionaries, given their used tea bags to missionaries? People living in the jungles with almost nothing and you send them used tea bags? It will not go well at the beam and seat for that kind of, that kind of behavior. It will not go well. You know, Paul says this and he must have had a reason to say it. In the context here, it appears that the teachings of the Judaizers were cutting into the support of those teaching the word in the Galatian churches. And so Paul exhorts them with a command. The fourth command in this list of five. He says, the one, those of you that are benefiting spiritually from the teaching of the word of God is to share all good things with the one who does that teaching. All good things can be material things, it can be financial things. It's really difficult to nail it down, which is which. But we know from the passages in Romans 12, Romans 15, 1 Timothy 5, 1 Corinthians 9, there's no reason why it would not entail financial things. Now, I've been in churches, 
I've been in church. I, was, I, I have, and the Lord blessed me with a whole sack full of beans. And we ate them, and it was good. And I've lived in the parsonage, and I didn't have a light bill, and I didn't have all these things, but I had food for which I was very, very grateful for. That's the way they ministered. Nothing wrong with that necessarily. It's the way they ministered. It's the way they ministered. It's what they could do. It wasn't only that. It wasn't only that. But that's, I, that's, that's fine. That's fine. But it includes both. There's no doubt that there, it includes both. So this is enforced. This is enforced by a, a general principle in verses 7 and 8. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh, for, will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So here's the responsibility that's enforced by this general principle. And there's three Three kind of statements. There's an alert, there's a warning, and then there's a statement in verse 8, and we'll, we'll look at that. So let's look at, let's look at first the alert. He says, do not be deceived. And that also is a command. It also is a command. Do not be deceived. And it's giving a solemn warning. Literally, the word deceive there is the word that we get planets from, our planets. And you know what planets do, right? They wander in the skies. So, literally, this word is to wander about. James, chapter 5, in verse 19, If any of you strays from the truth, that's your word, that's the word we have here, deceived. He's not talking about literally walking away, but metaphorically, if you depart and you wander away from the truth, don't forget about this, don't put this out of your mind, don't allow yourself... Because the passive voice here gives the warning. It gives it this sense. Don't allow yourselves to be misled. Don't allow yourselves to think otherwise. What? God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will reap. Don't forget this. Don't allow yourselves to to miss this. Remind yourselves of this. And the phrase occurs... Do not be deceived occurs two other times in Paul's letters, and both of them are in future contexts, eschatological contexts. One's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, and another one is in the 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. James uses it as well in James chapter 1 and verse 16. So that's the alert. After, the, after this statement here, the one who is taught the word, you are to share all good things with the one who teaches. The general principle, now, don't forget this. Don't allow yourselves to be tricked. Don't allow yourselves to be led astray here, deceived. The warning and the promise comes in verse 7. Here's the warning. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. The impossibility of cheating God. That's it. The impossibility of cheating God. And this truth has been recognized by God-fearing people and pagans alike. Aristotle used this phrase, recognized this in some of his writings. He used this principle. The word mocked here is, is the only time that it's used in the New Testament right here. Pretty unique word. It means literally to turn one's nose up at. You know the phrase. You know the attitude. And you turn, he just turned his nose up at me. Well, you know what they did. They just kind of scoffed at you. They, they communicated, I really don't regard your advice, and I don't believe you what you're saying. And so they turned their nose up, which means they didn't listen, they didn't take the advice, and they walked away and did whatever they wanted to do anyway. So it l- literally... The word means to turn one's nose up at someone. Hence to mock or to treat with contempt. Don't treat God with contempt. Don't allow yourself to be tricked into thinking that what you do will not come back on you at some point. What a man sows, he will reap. 
God is not mocked. Do you see how it's a general principle? Paul, Paul is saying, look, in the context here in verse 6, if you don't supply well, if you don't help them, and if that man who's teaching cannot devote himself to that and do the kind of study that he needs to do and present it in a winsome fashion, guess what? Guess who suffers? You do. You suffer. Hebrews 13, 17. Um, Hebrews 13, 17. The writer of the Hebrews says, it will not go well. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So in the context here, if you're thinking that oh, these guys don't deserve it and, 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 and I can get by without it, don't allow yourselves to be deceived. God, you're not going to flip your nose at God and get away with it. If this can't happen, you won't benefit. And that will not go well with you, Hebrews 13, 17. So that's what he's saying here in the context. But it is a general principle that applies in, a lot of, in all of areas of life. And we'll see that in verse 8, he broadens out. He broadens this principle out in verse 8. So the word mock means to thumb one's nose up. Now there's an intensified form of this word, which means there's a little, there's something on the beginning of the word. An intensified form of this word, and it's found in Luke chapter 16 and verse 14. And the passage reads this, like this. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. That's our word that we have here, only in Luke it's an intensified form. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 35, while Christ was hanging on the cross, it says this, the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Sneering is the word, an intensified form. Mocked. Thumb your nose up. Now the principle is, is so evident in farming and gardening. It's, we don't even have to think about it. If I drop a wheat seed in the ground, it's not going to sprout an apricot tree. You see how silly that sounds. So the principle is so evident in farming and gardening. The farmer respects the law. He sows his seed and he expects to reap in kind the kind of seed that he sows. And since the inescapable law of reaping what is sown has always been proved true, the proverbial statement and warning, God cannot be mocked, is also true. No one can mock God and get away with it. It will come back on you at some point in your life. And my guess, and I can even tell you personally, my own experience has been that the Spirit of God has a way of tweaking my memory and reminding me, hmm, I know why this is happening, or I got a suspicion why this, because I remember doing this to someone at one time. The Spirit of God may do that to you and just remind you, hmm, tap you on the shoulder and say, he just might do that. Sometimes kids get, you know how kids get real smart about the age of 25? No, not kids. Dads get smart. At 16, 17, at 25, all of a sudden dads are brilliant. Parents know what they're talking about. And the reality is we've always known. <laughs> you just discovered it until recently. And then you're reminded. Now, you might have guessed, you might have known, you might know this. The book of Proverbs is all over this principle, all over this. So let's look back at a few verses. Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Here's some stuff you can read to your children at home. Proverbs chapter 21. My practice is to read a proverb a day, and I read 21 on the 21st day. So I was reading this 
last uh, Wednesday, I think it was, something like that, Wednesday or Tuesday, and, and thinking about this passage in Galatians, it was on my mind, and I'm reading through chapter 21, and I thought, oh my, looky here. This principle is all over Proverbs. 21, chapter 21, verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. That's what you, throw, what you sow is what you reap. There's the principle right there. Verse seven, excuse me, verse seven. The violence of the wicked will drag them away because they refuse to act with justice. That's what you reap is what you'll sow. Verse 13. He who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be answered. What you reap is what you will sow. Verse 15. The exercise of justice is joy for the righteous but is terror to the workers of iniquity. They sowed iniquity and they reap, will reap iniquity because justice is a terror to them. But justice to the righteous is a joy. Verse 16. A man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. How's that? Eventually, it catches up with you. Verse 21. He who pursues righteousness and loyalty finds life, righteousness, and honor. Verse 23. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. There's a good one. Verse 28. A false witness will perish, but the man who listens to the truth will speak forever. Reaping and sowing. Chapter 22, verse 3. The prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. One more, verse 8 in chapter 22. He who sows iniquity will reap vanity, and the rod of his fury will perish. So you see the book, and there's, you could find this principle all over, mostly from chapters 10 through, verse, through chapters 30. The principle is all over there. Solomon knew it. The writers of Scripture were well aware of it. Even pagans throughout history has been, have been aware of this. The prophets knew it as well. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7 says this, For they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. At the same time, conversely, chapter 10 verse 12, Hosea writes, Sow with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness. So, beloved, do not allow yourselves to think that you get away with things, that this principle is not acting and working in the world. God is sovereign and providentially in control, and it works, and you cannot escape. We cannot escape this. Now, we all know, because we remember back to our younger days, we all know that there is a common tendency to think that there is one exception to this universal principle. And of course, that one exception is me. The one exception is you. Though it proves true for everyone else, we might think it is not true for me. I will not have to reap a harvest from the seeds I sow. I can sow whatever seed I want and still expect a good harvest. This common line of thought only proves the words of the prophet Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all else and is desperately sick. It just proves that passage in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. We have to face, beloved, that our capacity for self-deception is frightening, is it not? Our capacity for self-deception is frightening. We, We should not be deceived. We should not allow ourselves to forget this it is true it is amazing how blind otherwise brilliant people can be to their own spiritual direction in life in fact the more brilliant people are the more skilled they are at developing rationalizations to deceive themselves into hiding from God remember we've made the illustration before you know what children do right children do this and they say you can't see me now that sounds childish doesn't it Adults do the same thing. 
they go in their closet, whatever it may be, and they say, they do in effect this, and they say, God and nobody else can see. You see, the more brilliant people are, the more skilled they are at developing rationalizations to deceive themselves and think that they're hiding from God. You cannot get away from it. Instill this in yourself and your children that God is omniscient, He is omnipresent. Instill this idea, this accountability that God is always with you. You never, ever escape His presence, His awareness in your life that will guard you that will guide you that will be a protection for you that will keep you out of trouble because you know it's true and you try to and you and i would encourage you to try to instill this in your children because your children's accountability to god is far greater and far more better than their their accountability to you because they can fool you and they have before but they cannot fool god That's the one thing that when you leave the accountability of parents, you will carry that with you the rest of your life. Instill that in them now. Drive that in them now. God knows. God sees. And you cannot get away from God. And pray that the Lord causes their heart to welcome this truth and to embrace that truth to love that truth and not to be afraid of it, not to see it as as you shaking the bars of the jail. I want out, I want out. This is God's protection for you. It's a blessing to know this truth. You know, the story of Adam and Eve's hiding from God behind their skimpy clothes and even skimpier excuses is our common human experience. We were hiding. Are you kidding? Hiding? You had some animal skin on and you were hiding behind a bush or behind a tree? You see, to us that sounds so absurd. That's ridiculous. You know, the deceitfulness of sin can put a person to thinking that they actually can do that. Right? And you actually think that you can look at stuff on the internet and your wife and your husband and, and nobody finds out. And you actually thought you got away with it, didn't you? You didn't get away with it. You didn't get away with it. And it's going to boomerang back on you if you're not careful. It's going to affect you. Because what you sow is what you're going to reap. Don't be deceived about that. Paul's warning needs to be heard, and it needs to be heard often to warn us against our most brilliant self-delusions. Now this general truth does not necessarily entail God's future judgment. What goes around comes around, so to speak, and it might come around in our lifetime and often does. But here in the context, it's obvious that Paul does point to future judgment because in verse 8, he broadens this. One is destruction, the other one is eternal life. It's almost, it's almost a, a, a sort of a commentary on Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. What you earned, what you sown, here's your, che- here's your paycheck, death. So in verse 8, we have a scenario of the end results. A scenario of the end results. He says in verse 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In terms of his earlier statements, remember Paul had this statement, flesh and spirit, antithesis. Flesh and spirit, he was contrasting flesh and spirit. So in terms of his earlier antithesis between flesh and spirit, he reintroduces this contrast, flesh and spirit, And he integrates it in with the principle of consequences. And ties it all together here. That flesh and spirit, you might remember, began in chapter chapter 5, verse 16. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. You do this. You walk by the Spirit, you will not. A promise. Adamantly, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Well, in the end... After life is over, the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. 
that's not uh, less rewards for the believer in heaven. Corruption really means corruption. The kind of terms like that is never used of believers, of true believers in Scripture. Corruption. And the opposite is true for those who, re- who sows, what does he say? The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Corruption, eternal life. Those are your opposite ends. Those are the results. So he reintroduces that contrast and he integrates it with the principle of, con- of consequences. So what he does now is this antithesis between flesh and the spirit is carried to its practical conclusion. You know, life is just not going to go on forever. You can't keep practicing this without effects and results. It's carried to its practical conclusion. If we plant our behavior in the fleshly soil of selfishness and choosing to submit to the desires of self-interest and self-gratification, if we choose to follow our own agenda and do what we, will, we want to do and not what God's called us to do, we will, as a consequence, reap of harvest a harvest of defilement and destruction. The end is corruption. Not eternal life. It's corruption. The second part of verse 8, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. If we plant our behavior in obedience to the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit, chapter 5, verse 18, walking by the Spirit, chapter 5, verse 16, and being filled with the Spirit, verse 18, chapter 5, showing the fruit of the Spirit, verses 22 and 23, we will, as a consequence, harvest and experience eternal life. What goes around comes around. In the spiritual realm, men think that they can set aside this law. They sow to the flesh, hoping to reap in the spirit. And it can't be done. And some even hope for a spiritual reaping from no sowing whatsoever. And how very foolish is that? You see, the law of sowing and reaping is just as much a law of the soul as it is a law of the soil, as Paul presents it here. And we cannot escape the moral and spiritual consequences of our behavior any more than we can escape the physical consequences of our behavior, whether it be for good or for bad. God will not be fooled when we face him at the last judgment, waving the flag of faith, but have ignored its practical application in daily life. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Those who don't follow me are not my sheep. But I, you didn't follow me. You're not my sheep. So here is the responsibility of the taught. The provision for the teachers, materially, financially, this is an obligation, a responsibility that you have, you're benefiting from them. And the responsibility is enforced, particularly in in verse 7. Don't allow yourselves to think that it will go well with you if you don't. More broadly speaking, more broadly speaking, verse 8 You continue to sow to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. But if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap eternal life. So that responsibility is enforced by a general principle. It certainly goes well beyond what Paul has said here. So beloved, as we look through these commands, we we have one more section, verses 9 and 10. And you can see it's, Let us not lose heart in doing good. I admit to you, it gets wearisome at times. No doubt. It gets wearisome. But let's don't give up. Let's don't give up, beloved. And I have to I have to say, and I and I don't hesitate and I'm not shy about saying about this these people, you, the Lord has the people that the Lord has brought here, you have been extremely gracious 
people's needs have come up in this church and you have met the needs, whether they be at times financial and at times some sort of labor material is needed. And the body of Christ has stepped up time and time and time again and in matters of prayer as well. And from where I'm standing, it is such a joy, overwhelming joy to see this happening. It's just It knocks me to my knees. I am so thrilled to be among a people who love one another enough to give up things, give up time in order to meet one another's needs. There is no greater joy, 3 John 4, than I have than to see children walking in the truth. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for you. So appreciative of how God continues to work in your life. I'm thrilled to be here. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful for your goodness. We are thankful for your kindness that's constantly evident in our life. Father, you meet our needs through other people, through your people. And at times you meet our needs through through the world, through worldly means. You are providentially in control of everything. You're sovereign over all. And you choose to use the instrument you choose to use. We thank you for the constant provision that you have given to us. We thank you, God, that you, have, you continue to sustain us. We've received this warning from Scripture this morning that we cannot thumb our nose at you And expect to get away with it. We understand that you're gracious. And you have not dealt with us according to our sins. You've dealt with us according to your mercy. And we welcome a continual, continual action on your behalf toward us in that regard. But we also ask, Father, that we would never ever bring shame upon you. That we would be obedient. That you would find us faithful. Faithful stewards of these manifold treasures that you've given to us. May we understand that all things are from you and they are yours. And should you choose to take them back, then in your righteousness and in your goodness, you will take them back. May we always praise your name and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving These things we ask in our Lord's name. Amen.